like to say thank you to Brother Jared for reading our scriptural text which came from the book of Ephesians. The chapter was four, and the verses were 17 through 24. And it is from that passage of scripture that I would like to preach from the subject, the truth to inspire unity. The truth to inspire unity. My brothers and sisters, there are some things we have done in our past that we wish never to bring up, or I'm hopeful that no one ever thinks to talk about, especially in the presence of others. Sometimes our past is too hurtful to recall. We may have some regrets, either in opportunities we should have seized, or things said and done that were better left unsaid and undone. We may be presently living with an ailment, a scar, or a broken relationship because of sinful behavior and bad decisions made in our past. So we do not talk about it. But my question this morning is why? Are we fearful of the judgment we may receive from people who were unaware of things that we did or things done to us? Are we afraid of the perpetual unforgiveness displayed each time our name is brought up in conversation? Does it frustrate us as to how people are so enthusiastic to use our failures to falter our future? My question is, what are we to do? When, indiv when individuals refuse to let go of what we have let go of? Well, the answer is we need to own our history and not let our history destroy our destiny, but let God control our destiny. One of the things that I love about the scriptures is that it is full of stories of men and women just like us who were flawed yet faithful, virtuous yet struggled with vices. What God does is that he does not paint a picture of people in perfection by hiding their imperfections. But rather, what God does in scripture is that he gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly, to let us know what he approves of, what he disapproves of, and what is necessary for repentance, restitution, rehabilitation, and reconciliation. And Paul is not different in talking to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. He tells them what they used to be. And then after he tells them what they used to be, he goes on and shares with them what they ought to be. And this is the same message being shared with us this morning. Brethren, I am convinced that when we forget where we came from, then we cannot truly appreciate what we have now, nor display in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, the humility, gentleness, patience, and love, which is the conduct of unity given to us to help some troubled souls along who may not be what God wants them to be right now. Unity cannot exist or it cannot coexist with hypocrisy. There can be no unity if we are dishonest with our past fail to see current flaws, and are even blind to our own reflection seen in others. So there's two points and then some levels of application that I would like to make, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. First, let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 19 again. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 19. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. The book says... Now this I say and testify in the Lord, 
that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. Paul tells these Ephesians that this is how Gentiles walk, but this is how you also used to walk. And so I want to start off by talking about what we used to be. He gives three things in this letter. About he first talks about the futility of mind, futility of mind. See, before Christ, we used to have frivolous, empty aims in life and or unfixed and unsettled impulses. Futility of mind addresses the idea that we were simply thinking, speaking, and doing what we want without any thought of consequences. That's what futility of mind means. But he says, not only did you used to walk in the futility of your minds, but you also had, you were darkened in understanding. Darkened in understanding. See, before Christ... We were ignorant of God. We were ignorant of the way of salvation. We were ignorant of the love of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, sin has a way of doing more than separating us from God. But the book says that it darkens any chance for us to truly see and understand our amazing Savior and our true status before God. This is why you have people out in the world that's walking like they are doing just fine when we know that they are dying spiritually from a thing called sin. And so that also brings us to the third thing that the Apostle Paul talked about. He said, we used to be walking in the futility of our minds. We were darkened in understanding, but we were also alienated from the life of God. God wants to be the priority in our lives. But before Christ, we chose to be indifferent and hostile towards him by refusing to submit to the gospel call. What causes this alienation is our ignorance and hardness of heart. Through our ignorance, we have chosen to disregard that which is helpful. Through our hardness of heart, we have chosen to deny that which is holy. And so bringing this all together, the futility, the darkness, and the alienation, these three things, the Bible says, is what makes us callous. See, before Christ, there was no sense of shame. We shacked up and we didn't care what people thought. We did married things with people that we weren't married to, and we never thorough thought about that or what God thought about that. We wore things that left nothing to imagine, and we didn't care who was watching or how that made us look. Why? Because we were callous as a result of our futility, our darkness, and our alienation. We were without conscience, without fear of God, and no regard of man. There was no perception of the dignity of humanity, no glory of the divine image. We were made in the image of God, but we didn't care that we were doing things that didn't make us look ator. We had no concept of how degrading sin was and how sin still is degrading. To me, sex used to be our God, and it became an addiction that has led to practice, as the book says, every kind of, of impurity. We may have been all of these things, most of these things, some of these things, 
or if we're honest, at least one of these things. Wherever we may have landed on the spectrum for unity to take place among God's people, the 6 a.m. workers need to show humility, gentleness, patience, and love to the 5 p.m. workers, remembering where they were when the Lord of the vineyard found them holding up the streets, uh, holding up the walls of the city while we were on the street corner, according to Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Those that read the Bible understand that analogy. That was a parable. What, you was given a parable? Yes, that was a parable. The parable in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. See, when there is radio silence, that means that something was said that we don't quite understand. And so in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the Jesus gives a parable about how the kingdom of God is like. And he talks about how the owner of the vineyard goes out to the street and he finds people on the corner. And he says to them, why are you out here on the corner? He said, no one has hired us. They said, come, work in my vineyard, and I'll give you what's due. And then three hours later, the owner of the vineyard went back to the strange, same street corner, found some more people, hired them. And then at noon, did the same thing and hired them. And then at 3 p.m., did the same thing and hired them. And then at 5 p.m., he goes out and he says, what are you guys doing out here on the street corner? He said, no one has hired us. He says, come work in my vineyard and I'll give you what's due. So those men go and they work for one hour and then he calls all the workers and he commands that the people that came last should get paid first. And so when they were paid a certain amount of money, the people that was there since 6 a.m. said, well, if the people that work one hour is getting paid this much, then I can't wait to get paid because I know I'm going to get more because I've done more. And then when they get there, they get paid the same amount of money. And they're angry, failing to realize that that's what they agreed to do the work for at 6 a.m. And the owner of the vineyard says, it's my money. I can do what I want to do with it. And if it's fair for me to to pay the person that has come at 5 the same thing that I pay you at 6 a.m., what does it matter to you? And so sometimes those of us that have been in the vineyard since 6 a.m., we forget what we were doing before the Lord called us. And so when people come at 5 p.m. and they don't quite know how to do the work, doing for the past 11 hours, we have a tendency to unjustly judge. But there can be no unity until such a time that we remember what we used to be. That we were in the same condition as these individuals and the only reason why there is disunity and we get angry and we start judging is because we forgot that we used to be jacked up from the floor up some time ago. Amen. And so, again, unity cannot coexist with hypocrisy. Brings us to our second point. What we ought to be. What we ought to be. Paul not only tells them what they used to be, but he goes on and shares with them what they ought to be. Look at verses 20 through 24. Paul says, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Just like Paul says that there were three things that we used to be that we need to stop being, he says there are three things that we need to be and that we ought to be. He tells us first, we need to put off the old self. We need to put off the old self. The Bible tells us that the old self walked like the Gentiles. They were futile in mind, darkened in understanding, alienated from the life of God. They were callous. 
The old self was submissive to sensuality. The old self was greedy to practice every kind of impurity. The old man is how we used to live. The old person, the Bible tells us, was corrupt through deceitful desires. This is the man that must be crucified with Christ. Listen to your Bible. In Galatians chapter 2 and the verses 20. Galatians, the chapter is 2 and the verses 20. The Bible reads, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Also in Colossians chapter 3, in the verses of 5 and 6, Colossians chapter 3, Verse 5 and 6, the Bible reads, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. If we don't know what's earthly in us, Paul explains. He says sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath, of God is coming. We also read in Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 13 through 14. Romans chapter 8, verses 13 through 14. The apostle continues to write, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. But not only are we commanded to put off the old self, the Bible goes on and shares with us that we need to renew the spirit of We need to renew the spirit of our mind. Our mind must go through something called a renovation. Putting off the old self is the ceasing of sin. But renewing our minds involves a change of attitudes regarding sin, holiness, and righteousness. And so what we see in this text is that we are commanded to hate sin, but at the same time, we are commanded to love holiness and righteousness. That's what the renewing of the mind does. It flips these things. See, before we were in Christ, we loved sin, hated holiness, hated righteousness. This is why we need to renew our minds so that we now hate sin and love holiness and righteousness. Listen to your Bible. Romans chapter 12 and the verses 2. In Romans chapter 12 and the verses 2, Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your what? Of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He goes on to share with us, in Psalm 51, verse 10, David writes, in Psalm 51, verse 10, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And then we go to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Lamentations chapter 5. Verse 21 and 22, where the Bible reads, Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. So not only do we have to put off the old self, but once we have put off the old self, we need to renew our mind. 
and after we have put off the old self and renewed our minds, we need to now put on the new self. The new self is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, the new self must start to look more and more like Jesus. Now, why must the new self start to look more and more like Jesus? It is because Jesus is the image of the invisible God, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The new self must begin to express to true righteousness. And righteousness is doing the right things, the right ways, for the right reasons. Righteousness, the Bible says, is what we need to be pursuing, according to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. The new self must produce true holiness, which is the highest sense belonging to God. And it extends to the children of God as consecrated to the Lord's service. We must conform in all things to the will of God. Therefore, we must be holy <clears throat> as he is holy. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. So we said all of that to say these three things. Let's talk about the application. The first application is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. We're going to look at that verse again. The book says, <clears throat> but that is not the way you learned Christ. What we should learn from verses 17 through 24 is that in order for us to inspire unity, we must learn Christ. We need to study the Savior. We need to learn how he walked. We need to walk that way. We need to learn how he spoke, and we need to speak that way. We need to learn how he reverenced God, and we must fear God that way. We must learn how he treats people and treat people that way because people cannot come to Jesus unless they first see Jesus in the worshipers of Jesus. That's why we need to learn Christ. That's why we need to study the Savior. But not only that, that brings us now to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. In 2 Peter... Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, listen to what the apostle says. He says, for whoever lacks these qualities is so short-sighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So if the first point is that we need to learn Christ and study the Savior, we need to obey this command and do not become blind. In order for us to inspire unity, we cannot be blind. We may not be what we used to be, but if the truth is told, none of us are where we ought to be. Therefore, we need to take heed lest we fall. This is the warning the Apostle Peter gives the brethren in this text. He said, yes, you need to keep adding to your faith virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity. You need to grow in these qualities. It's not enough to possess them. You need to mature in them because if you don't mature in them, you think you've arrived when you have them at a fundamental level and then you will definitely fall because you have forgotten from whence you came. And so he warns us. Don't become blind. Don't forget what you used to look like. Don't forget what you're supposed to look like. Because if you do, you will indeed fall. That brings us to our third and final point, which is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. 
the Bible reads, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We need to learn Christ, study the Savior. We must not become blind. And the third thing that we should learn about inspiring unity is the fact that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So we are called upon this morning to be an example, but not only be an example, but to help the weak and to be blessed through our giving. And so as we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, these verses are a vivid reminder that unity is easily inspired when we come to understand that the bond we share with all people is our life before Christ, which should motivate us to do what it takes to create a new bond in Christ. Therefore, this provokes us to be humble. It provokes us to be gentle. It provokes us to be patient and loving with others because somebody had to be humble, gentle, patient, and loving with each and every one of us. This is the truth that inspires unity. So where do you stand this morning? Either you're walking in Christ or you're walking as the Gentiles. And so if you find yourself outside of Christ, outside of Jesus, outside the body of Christ, don't let your futility of mind, your darkened understanding, and your alienated state keep you from right that wrong this morning. You've heard the word of God according to Jix 45. The question is, do you believe that Jesus, who he says he is, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world, that he is the one that came to redeem us and deliver us from hell? John 3, 16. Will you repent this morning? Will you stop doing things your way? Would you stop doing things the way you think are right and start doing the things that God says is right. Will you hate sin this morning and start loving righteousness and holiness? Because if we do not renew our minds, we will perish. Luke 13, 3. Will you openly and publicly confess that this Jesus who we've been preaching about is really and truly the son of the living God. Would you pledge your allegiance to the one who is king of kings and lord of lords this morning, according to Matthew 10, 32? Will you be baptized? Will you have your sins washed away this very day, putting off the old man, renewing your mind, and putting on the new man this morning by meeting the blood of Jesus in this watery grave of baptism because Jesus tells us in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That when you come up out the water, when you have made contact with the blood of Jesus, God will forgive you of your sins, Acts 2, 38. He will make you a new creature in Christ Jesus According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, what kind of creature, a creature from this day forward that will learn Christ, study Christ, and imitate Christ? A creature that will no longer be blind to their former status and would be empathetic and sympathetic towards those that are new to the body. A creature that will show how much they care so that people can understand what God has said. God stands ready this morning to add you 
You don't have to join. You don't have to search because God himself, when you obey the gospel, will add you to his church. The only church that you can read about in scripture. And that church is the church of Christ. Jesus said he was going to build that church in Matthew 16, 18. He built that church in Acts chapter 2. He purchased that church with his blood, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 28. And he adds the save to it, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47. So why not become a member of a going church for a coming Lord, which does all that God authorizes? And if you are a member of the body of Christ, if you have obeyed the gospel, but for some reason, you haven't been honest with yourself and honest with others and therefore have produced disunity within this local congregation, within your community, within your family, even within yourself, then this is your opportunity to start speaking the truth and inspiring unity in all areas where there are schisms in your life. You know, the old people used to say, you need to just simply tell the truth and shame the devil in the church house. Well, we in the church house this morning. Go ahead and tell the truth. Shame the devil. Send him packing this very day. Tell him to be gone like Jesus told him to be gone in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10. Tell him that he can't live here anymore. That you're all about doing that which is right. Stop listening to the old man. See, if you're listening to the old man, that old man was buried. That means you're listening to a ghost. That means something's wrong. Listen to the new man. Listen to Jesus. Listen to the one that was dead but now is alive forevermore. Listen to him. Let his voice guide you. Let the scriptures take you and cause you to be all that he died for you to be. He died so that you can live. So stop resurrecting stuff that's going to separate you from an eternal home in glory with him forevermore. This is your opportunity to repent, to pray, ask for forgiveness. Confess your faults, have your brothers and sisters pray with you and for you. For the scriptures say, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Somebody will be able to get an audience with God this morning. All you have to do is make it known what it is that you're trying to get right. If you struggle with the old man, let Jesus help you with that this morning. If you struggle with the renewing of your mind, let Jesus help you with that. This morning, if you struggling, trying to keep the new man on, let Jesus help you with that this morning. So wherever you are, hear the voice of God calling the prodigal, calling those who have been extravagantly wasteful, whether in or outside of Christ. He's calling you home this day.